All right, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce our, our final speaker for the, uh, the illicit networks in the aid of globalization workshop. Uh, Dr. Moise Naeem is a senior associate at uh, Carnegie's International Economics Program, where his research focuses on international economics and global politics. He is the author and editor of numerous books, his most recent one, Illicit, which is sitting on my nightstand. Are you ready to read that? Thank you. Um, uh, he has been the chief international economist for El País, Spanish's La Spain's largest newspaper. Uh, his public service includes his tenure as Venezuela's Minister of Trade and Industry in the early 90s, uh, director of Venezuela's Central Bank, and executive director of the World Bank. He's the chairman of the board of the Group of 50 and a member of the board of directors of the National Endowment for Democracy, the International Crisis Group, and Population Action International. Uh, he holds an MS and a PhD degree from MIT. So on that uh, note, I would like to give the floor to the good doctor. Thank you, Andy, and thank you all. I'm painfully aware that I am standing here on the last obstacle between here and your home. So after two long days of conversations. So I'll try to be brief and leave as much time as possible or as little time as possible for questions and answers so you can move on. I will start by making uh, some provocative, uh, uh, perhaps even a bit exaggerated, but not that much assertions. And I will try to persuade you that I'm right. Uh, the first one is that the, the ascent of the international criminal networks uh, that trade on all sorts of stuff, uh, drugs and uh, uh, humans uh, and uh, weapons uh, and illegal uh, and, and logging and, and, and counterfeits have become so large, so global, so powerful, so politically connected that they are up there as a threat uh, uh, as, uh, uh, with terrorism. Uh, and I will try to explain that because I know that terrorism looms large in the conversation, and this is uh, seen often dismissively as just you know crime, as it has always been with us, and there's nothing new under the sun. I will try to explain why there is plenty that is new under the sun uh, in this regard. And one of the things that I'm going to concentrate is to uh, say that we should no longer worry. Uh, about all networks, about uh, the trade, about everything. We have to worry mostly about governments that have been taken over by criminals. And in fact, by governments that uh, have become themselves criminal enterprises. I believe, and I think uh, there is plenty of evidence, that the most dangerous lag in our collective understanding is that criminal enterprises have now become governments. And that some governments have taken over criminal organizations, not to dismantle them, but to use them for their financial, political, and military advantage. Criminals are becoming politicians and government officials. And top government officials and political leaders are doubling as the heads of vast and often international criminal enterprises. Uh, and that's the theme. And uh, I care less about who smokes what than which government is being uh, taken over by the cartels uh, that are trading in drugs or in people or in weapons. I also want to stress that in this field, uh, we are at an extremely primitive level of intellectual, professional, conceptual development. This is very, very primitive. We are still at the beginning of what to understand. We lack data. We don't have very good data. When we have data, we don't have very good tools to interpret them. And I'm not talking about computer models. I'm talking about conceptual models of how, what to make out of this. Uh, we have an immense uh, uh, fragmentation in dealing with the field. That fragmentation is profession, is academics. If you talk to the lawyers that deal with this, you will discover that they see a world that the people in finance don't see or see it a completely different way. If you talk to the people that are in finance and then talk to some of the law enforcement uh, uh, official, officers, you'll see that they see a different world. If you talk to those that are in charge of containing the international trade in counterfeits, they see a different world and they worry about different things and they use different tools 
that people that are worrying about international trade on nuclear technology, uh, and so on and so forth. So there is intellectual fragmentation, there is professional fragmentation, uh, and there is uh, uh, international fragmentation. Uh, and that is nothing new. We know how hard it is for different agencies to collaborate inside the same country. We know how much more that uh, problem is, uh, how more, more profound it is, and more difficult when it's a matter of collaborating uh, across national boundaries. This creates another characteristic of the field, which is a profound asymmetry between those in charge of containing the growth of these enterprises and the enterprises themselves. We are dealing with uh, entrepreneurs that are at the forefront of globalization. These are groups and individuals that see opportunities earlier than most of us, even earlier than other multinationals. Uh, they, are driven, they, they are capable of recruiting and hiring uh, some of the best talent in the world. So they have the best people in terms of information technology and computers and, uh, and, 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 and IT. Uh, the best lawyers, the best financiers, the best banks, the best politicians, the best journalists, the best generals, the best judges, uh, the best diplomats around the world. And uh, uh, the agencies in governments that have to deal with them don't have all of that, or have that in even more limited capabilities. I am not talking about the United States government, by the way. I'm talking about governments in other countries that are trying to deal with this, that do not have the resources. But even in the case of the United States, it's patent and it's evident uh, that there is an asymmetry between uh, the capabilities, resources, dynamism, speed uh, with which uh, these agencies uh, have to deal with uh, the, the criminals and the criminals. See, I have been researching this now for more than 15 years. Uh, and I have not found one instance uh, of success. I, of course, found many instances in which a specific uh, law enforcement agency, a specific government has dismantled a specific network, a specific ring, people go to jail, people are executed, uh, 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 networks are dismantled. But if you ask any government, has the activity decreased, declined? Show me one market in drugs, in pick one that is an illicit, internationally traded illicit activity. And uh, see if uh, it is today smaller <coughs> than it was 10 years ago. The answer is no. So governments are losing all around that battle. I uh, uh, think about money laundering. Is there today less money laundering than there was 10 years ago? No. And I think there's plenty of evidence uh, about that if you go to the International Monetary Fund uh, and you look. Uh, at, the, at what they estimate, there is a, in, in the balance of payments analysis of the, of the um, IMF, there is, an account, there is an, a line item called errors and omissions, uh, which is what you, you, you know, when you cannot account for certain transactions. That account, and of course, I'm not at all suggesting that uh, all of that is money laundering, nor I'm suggesting that all money uh, laundering is associated with uh, criminal enterprises of this sort. Uh, but uh, that, that account is, is, is growing quite significantly. Uh, the asymmetry is also determined by, uh, the, by borders. Borders are heaven, it's, borders are nirvana for the traffickers. National borders are what create the price differentials that justify the profits, and also the shields that, uh, that allow them to hide behind uh, 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 law enforcement agencies and governments that are seeking. Of course, there are uh, um, coordinating mechanisms and alliances and working together between uh, agencies from different governments. But you know better than I that for a government agency to work uh, uh, in a jurisdiction not of its own is like uh, any of us working on the water. It's very artificial. We need all sorts of equipment. We need all sorts of infrastructure to be able to operate in a habitat that is unnatural to us. For any government official, it's not natural to work in another country, even if you are an ambassador. You need a panel of uh, uh, regulations, of institutions, and, and frameworks that limits your ability to operate. 
Uh, so, whereas for governments, uh, borders are very confining. For traffickers, borders are what justifies their existence, is what protects them, is what uh, uh, makes their life possible, and uh, their ability to make money uh, even uh, higher. Uh, the I want to talk to you about three illusions and three blurrings. The three illusions is that uh, there is nothing new under the sun. That crime is uh, uh, essentially more of the same and it has been with us since time immemorial. The Bible talks about it and so the black markets and smuggling and all that is <coughs> part of the human experience. So there's nothing new under uh, the sun. That's an illusion. That's a wrong way to think about it. The other is that uh, illicit trades and uh, these kinds of uh, stuff I'm talking about is about crime. And I uh, will argue that it's no longer about crime. It's of course about crime, but it's far more than that. And if you just think about it uh, that in terms of crime, then the traditional way of dealing with it requires the, the typical institutions. You need law enforcement, you need uh, uh, courts, uh, you need jails, and you need churches and schools. It's about values and it's about uh, dealing with uh, uh, people that need to be educated, that the people that need to be given values and, and moral uh, strength, or be put in jail. Well, I'm going to argue that that's only part of the picture. And the illusion that you can deal with these issues only through traditional ways of uh, crime fighting is a very dangerous illusion. And the third illusion is that this is deviant. Remember uh, on day one of the conference where uh, uh, I think one of the presenters talked about <laughs> deviant, gov deviant governments or deviant enterprises and deviant people and deviant, you know, the people, the notion that people that are involved in this are deviants. And that comes from the criminal, the criminal, you know, all the literature of criminology, essentially, you know, Lombroso and all of the father, the founding fathers of criminology, Essentially, the sociology of deviancy is that you are a criminal if you are deviant. Well, it so happens that the deviance is, is here. You are deviant. Because there, in many countries, the rest of the world, uh, uh, normalcy is defined of being involved in these kinds of stuff. Think about uh, about 8 to 10% of China's GDP is associated with the manufacturing and exporting of counterfeit goods. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of families. That's a lot of uh, economic activities that are related to something that we call a crime, and for them is their daily life. Every day, millions of people wake up and go to work, and work all day and bring bread to their families, thanks to doing something that here we would call it a criminal activity. Think about Afghanistan. 60% of, Afghan of, uh, uh, of the of Afghanistan's GDP is associated with poppy production, cultivation, distribution. You know how many people ought to be involved in that? That's a nation. Are you, are you ready to call that nation a nation of deviants? So the third illusion is that we are talking about deviancy when in fact a, a lot of what we describe as deviancy uh, is our own deviancy. Those are the three illusions. And the three blurries is uh, the blurring between legal and illegal uh, private sector. Uh, the second is between legal and illegal politics. And the third is between legal and illegal philanthropy. Essentially, my take is that these are businesses. If you're a big business and you're a regulated business, it is absolutely normal for you to take part of your revenues to influence the regulators. The financial industry does that, the pharmaceutical industry, universities do that, that. In some countries, that is called corruption. In other countries, it's called lobbying. But essentially, it is about taking parts of your revenues and, and influence the government officials that make the decisions that impact your bottom line. 